Thank you very much. Really, I just want to say uh, on the words of my colleague, first of all, really thank you, everybody. Just as I mentioned yesterday, such a beautifully inspiring weekend, and I want to thank everybody, our speakers and participants, and everybody who makes this all possible. So, so, so thank you very much. A special thank you, of course, to Emma Tai and Amanda Gildi. It was really a, a pleasure partnering with you, and we look forward to many uh, joint ventures in the future. You want to hear more about it? He just gave a six part series for on uh, medical issues on um, just a couple months ago on the Zoom channel. And for that, I'll encourage people if you want to hear to emotionally have about you know, you know, 10 classes a week online. It's not quite the same. But you'll be known as giving class at the 9 30, but nobody here can go. That's any great. And uh, in honor, but then when I leave tag, I guess I'll, I won't tell anybody. But, um, so uh, please join in if you like. I don't know when and where the next medical ethics, you know, um, your conference is going to be. But uh, I do know, please God, that in the summer we'll be having three trips to Portugal, Tunisia, and Greece. People here you can speak to who I think will tell you what a wonderful experience this is. These are groups in Jewish history. The way we do in that context, I feel like I'm sure um, you can ask around the room people who are I do encourage if you don't have any summer plans, uh, these are learning trips. Really, we sit and uh, do a lot of learning as we travel through Portugal and Greece and all these places. So, that's something to put in mind. And I just also want to make mention we just started um, our first real podcast. Um, JJ Kimchi, who's a graduate um, fellow at Harvard, um, is starting he's interviewing people basically every three four weeks we're releasing another one there's three that we have sent out so i encourage you to make uh, this and i know they've been extremely popular it's really quite, quite fascinating and some of the uh the, the guests we have so that's the um uh the broadcast the jewish idea so i in, encourage that and i just want to um you know we look forward to many opportunities for, for learning many many and they and a gate race. So I uh, look forward to learning with you in person as we travel online and all the ways that out of yet. Okay. And uh really thank you again. And I'll turn it over to the laser who also gets a, a tremendous access like for 14 years. For 14 years, year in and year out, it's uh this laser organizes our programs and topics. So so thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of the morning. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, Jay. Um, so here we are. Uh, I feel like this is like the Shmini uh, uh, of type of program. So uh, first of all, um, I hope that, so just to, today we're going to be doing a little bit about mental health. Uh, we're going to finish our uh, amazing Shabbos and amazing weekend. So like I said, I want to share with you, is this an open space? Can I, uh, you know, tell you a little bit about how I, I, I feel? Um, so uh, that's how I learned uh, from this weekend. This is how you begin a conversation. So um, not trying to be humorous, but this weekend has been really an emotional roller coaster. Um, you know, we 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 sort of um, there were times that I looked around and during Kabbalah Shabbos there was elation. There was it was a tremendously uplifting davening. It was a beautiful. There was a moment of uh, of uh, of really simcha. Um, and then during the meal at, uh, at, at the One, there were tears. Um, you know, I looked around the audience. There were, it was just, you know, um, and at different points of the, of, the, of, the, of the Shabbos and the experience, you had people realize, you, you know, the, 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 the conversations were very, very hard. They were very heavy. But the beauty of it was all, it was done in a way that was al derech Torah. It was done al the Rabbanim. It was done in such a way that was such, you know, that is, that is, yes, that is life. We go through our ups and downs and we go through that beautiful Kabbalah Shabbos and then we go through that, that uh, those emotional difficulties. So I'm sharing with you, this is difficult. And now as I look around, I'm saying to myself, I don't know about you, but I feel like this is taking me back to when in my childhood when I was like in camp and it's like the last day of camp and it's like, uh, really? Okay. You're going to give me your number? You're going to call me? Really? Okay. So just remember that. We'll have to do that. So um, just a few housekeeping items, and I don't want to take any more time. Um, for those that re require CME evaluations and uh, credits, um, you know, again, it's a very simple uh, thing. Go online, get your, you, you, you put in your evaluation, you get a CME certificate. You don't put it in, you don't get a certificate. That's the that's the house rule, not our house rules. That's the house rules from McGill University. You get up to 15 hours. 
um, um, you put in what you attended and the, the honor system, obviously, for that. Um, I really want to take the opportunity to call. Sorry? I think we'll just post the link on the website. Mm -hmm. This is a page of medical ethics, it'll say the um, conference evaluation. Um, past experiences said that by around 11 30, 12 people are looking at their flights, they're flight aware, they're got, you know, if, if people are getting nervous a little bit and they're starting to move around. So I want to take this opportunity when it's still relatively calm to really individually thank all of our speakers uh, who were amazing. Um, really. Without a doubt, each one brought to the table an amazing array of ideas, thoughts, um, and, and leadership, and uh, really the, the, the world class. I mean, the idea that you know that that we're able to bring in in, into this into this day. So each one of you, I want to just thank you personally for making this and such an easy, such a pleasantness about being able to work with people that are you know elite in their in their fields, and you speak to them, and they they they're like, sure, what do you need? What can I help you with? So it's just uh, absolutely amazing. So. With that backdrop, um, it's it's really a pleasure that we're going to be discussing today. We're going to wrap up with some mental health issues. Um, um, our first uh, topic again, uh, we were of Steinberg, and uh, we're going to be dealing with the, some of the halachas with regards to elderly parents. Uh, Rav Steinberg. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. And again, I think I speak on behalf of everyone here, thanking uh, Rabbi Kelman and Dr. Friedman for organizing such an inspiring, well organized, and friendly, and yet a learning experience a conference. And as we said at the beginning, it's number 14, Yad Yad Hazaka. Hopefully, there will be more and we'll find the right materials as long as we go with the, with the numbers. Um, <laughs> the, the, the parents is, is a topic uh, nowadays because we almost all of us experience having elderly parents, and uh, on the one hand, it's a big schools to have uh, up to an advanced age. But on the other hand, of uh, the parents being elderly suffer from all kinds of uh, illnesses, some are mental, some are physical, dementia, and others. And this very simple task, both from a so, from a halachic point of view, sometimes the parents need a blood test or a doctor visit. If you go on and what you want of me, what do you such a situation? Sometimes it is costly. There are expenses to keep an elderly parent. We should pay the bills, the parent, where should this parent be if he is misbehaving, is very uh, ill or demented, should we think a daughter when the spouse doesn't like in, in, in such a decision making? Obviously, there are a lot of social that will bring to, to a party where everyone will see how, how bad it is for the family. Certainly, something really. How do you explain the grandchildren and sometimes the great grandchildren how grandpa is looking or grandma is looking and behaving and remember? Uh, not the best one. So this just a few of these that I'm sure everyone uh, has experienced or is experiencing uh, with an elderly parent. Can you please put the mic a little bit closer to you? It keeps adding in and out. Please. Oh, no, something. Um, well, it's a magnet. 
something technical. Anyway, so let me start with the fundamental issues regarding the uh, relationship between a parent and a child. There are several uh, the relationship between a, a child and a parent, well, which is one of the ten commandments, so it's really a very, very important mitzvah according to the understanding of the Torah. It is that Kabelet Avicha Vertimecha goes with a prize. So that is worthwhile to do it, not only because the Torah is telling us to do it, not only because from a holistic point of view that's the right thing to do, it's also something perhaps worthwhile. So Kabbalah Avicha Vetumecha is one. If you know the Aviv Tirao, Korin is another Chiv, Mate Aviv Imo Amot Yomot, and Aruv Makle Aviv Imo. So at least four uh, is suing the writer or Chiyubim, the writer regarding uh, the relationship between a child and a parent. What are the differences between those uh, uh, mitzvot? So the remember in, uh, in Kiddushin goes into details on how they are fulfilling these mitzvot. In general, said, Ibud Avem is a positive obligation. Morah Avem is a negative obligation. Meaning, Ibud Avem, the Yemen gives examples that you have to feed them, you have to uh, behave nicely to them, you have to respect them by uh, telling them uh, good things, and many other such examples which are on the positive side. You have to do something to show that you are Makai in the mitzvah. Moab is not to do certain things which violate or humiliate the parent. So you don't sit in his place, you don't argue with him, you do, or with her, obviously, father and mother. These are on the negative side, and the combination is that you should view your parent as a very dignified person. No education, uh, origin, behavior, all this is important. The parent is a very distinguished person to you, and you have to do positive things in order to show that you respect him, and you shouldn't do things which show the opposite. I remember my father used to speak to his father in the third person. And he never sat in, in his chair when it was his own chair in his home, or when he visited us and he had his chair and no one uh, was sitting there. Uh, and Zaman Erbach even went further and did he would up there into his in your parents. And when his, fa when his father in law was alive, he always used to sit at the head of the table of Shamazan who was of Shomazim and sat uh, in the side, and when his father-in-law passed away, his mother-in-law lived a long life, I think she passed away at the age of 96 or 97, so even though the father-in-law wasn't alive already, he never sat on his place because he didn't want to show his mother-in-law that he replaces him. So, until the age of, I don't know, 80, he never sat at the head of the table in his own house. So these are uh, signs that show that you have to do more than the usual is to respect and not to do something which is irrespectful. There's a machlokis in, in the Gemara in Kiddushin, we shall me who is to pay the expenses in order to take care of the father. So when uh, Amara says we shall burn, the, the son has to not only respect the father, not only not be the leader of the things, but also respect the father. We shall burn. But the halacha, luckily or not, the halacha is we shall add. Expenses have to come 
from the father's or mother's uh, assets, the child is mechuyav, is obligated to respect him, but not obligated to pay. What happens if the father doesn't have money? And you need to put him in an institution, you need to pay his bill, you need to pay his uh, medical uh, treatments. Then it's according to the halacha, it's just as a stock. The son is not obligated as being the son, but he is obligated as anyone else who has to give stock to it if it is money. But all the rest is a fee of the right. Now, according to the halacha, that's again a matriarch, but according to halacha, a father can be mindful on the He can say to the son, don't take care of me, don't address me, don't elevate such things. But no, he can't be mindful. If you are degrading the father, if you are humiliating him, even if he agrees to it, you're not allowed to do. So the positive side is dependent on the father's wish or mother's wish. But the negative side, even if the parents agree for some form of uh, violating morals, it, it's not uh, helpful. It's a very uh, unique situation because actually we are not allowed to hit anyone. What's the difference between hitting a friend or uh, another person and the father and mother? And there is a significant difference. If I hit someone, that is an isula. Lo see if I won't go into the discussion on how it comes out, but it's an isula. Whereas Makeh Aviv Veimo Mot Yumat, there is a capital punishment. So this, as we will see in a minute, makes a major difference in treating a father versus treating someone who is not a father or a mother. There it's on, only, quote unquote, the love. And here it's a Chiyu Misa. Now, Makeh Aviv Veimo, that is a chiyuv misa is defined as causing a chabala to the father, and a chabala, as we discussed uh, earlier, is only if blood comes out. So, if someone is hurting his parent to the degree that blood is coming out, he is mechuyav misa. He is uh, punishable by capital punishment. Whereas if he does the same to another person, then it's only an issue love, and we'll see in a minute what the consequences of it are. So now some practical issues. Often in advanced age, as we said, there might be a situation where the father is demented, the father has the Parkinson's, the father uh, has a psychiatric disorder, or the father is ill, he has cancer, he has diabetes, he needs treatment. So if the son or the daughter feel that they can't take care of the father because he is violent, he is disruptive, and what do you do in this situation? So there's an interesting Machloi case, how much does the son, the child, need to bear the behavior of the parent. Is it preferable to put him away in an institution or preferable to keep him at home? And there are pros and cons to each of these uh, solutions. If you put him in an institution, then someone else is taking care of him. So I won't violate Makiavi uh, Vimo or Moraav. Sometimes it's so bad that I may express myself in a this uh, respectful way and we said that's an issue that the father can't even be more if it's an institution someone else is allowed to take care of it if you need to restrain the father or the mother because they are very violent so if you are the son you're not allowed to do it because you are doing an act which humiliates your father and that is not allowed to be done if it is someone in the institution, he is part of any other uh, 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 people who are taking care. 
There is a shita that you're not allowed to put him away because this by itself is a humiliative uh, act. You just want to get rid of your father rather than making the effort to take care of him. But in my opinion, nowadays it's different than in the days that this machlokis took place because then the institutions were poor places, people were hit, people were uh, put in, in punishments, and the, the, the institutions were really uh, uh, humiliating uh, places. Nowadays, if for money you can get a good institution, I think that's preferable if you can't take care of your father because of his, uh, or mother because of his behavior, that it should be done by a more professional uh, caregiver or an institution. Now, sometimes the son or the daughter want to have the parent with them and take care of them, but the spouse doesn't agree. And the spouse doesn't have a chiyu. It's a, it's a machloik as if, I, I told you the story about the Shomazam about his in-laws because he has the chumra that there is kibbut avem also on, on an in-law parent. But that's a chumra. The, the, the aloche does not require that far. So if the daughter-in-law, for instance, doesn't want to have uh, the parents-in-law with her, then Shlom Bais takes over, and if you can find a good uh, place, then uh, that should be uh, the solution. So that is one issue that uh, comes up quite often. Another issue that comes up is when the parent is a... Uh, uh, demanding things either for himself or for his uh, child that is inappropriate. Let's say he demands to not to treat him in a certain way for his illness and he is not competent. He is now uh, demented. He doesn't understand the situation. And in order to do good for him, you have to force him to get the treatment. Who should do it? So again, it's preferable that someone else should do it rather than the child, because the child doing something forcefully may violate morale. But if you have a, an aide and they do it forcefully, that is fine, because that is the good for the father. Sometimes the father has requests from the, from the child that are irrational. And he says, you must do so-and-so, you must not do so-and-so. Usually, the obligation is to fulfill the requests of a parent. That's part of Kibbut Avem. But if it's irrational, obviously, uh, you should find a way uh, to, to not to do it without violating the, or humiliating the father. There is a special uh, discussion regarding a son or a daughter who are a physician and they can treat the father. That's their uh, profession to treat. Are they permitted to treat the father if it involves makea vivimo? Let's say the, the father needs surgery. Obviously, if the son will do the surgery, blood will come out. And if blood comes out, that is makea vivimo. So how do we do it, not for a parent, how do we do it for, for a patient? You're not allowed to, to, to hit a patient as well. So the answer is that if it's done for the benefit of the patient, then there is no issue of makea, that's obvious. So if the uh, physician is the, the friend of a person, or, or a stranger, he can do the operation for the benefit of the patient, even though he's causing a chabala. That's obvious. But if he does it for his father or for his mother, we said that if it is a makah shel chabala, which means that blood comes out, then it is chiyuv misa. He, he is being, uh, he, he will be punished with capital punishment. So the uh, the, the answer to it is that indeed, whatever is needed for the treatment, he can do, because that is for the benefit of the father. 
The fear, however, is that he may do a little more than is needed for the treatment. Let's say he's a surgeon and he has to do a two centimeter cut and he did two and a half centimeter cut, the extra half centimeter is a makea vivimo and he will be liable to a capital punishment. So therefore the agreement amongst the poskim is that whatever another physician can do the procedure, it's preferable then the son should do it, except for two major conditions. There are several more, but two major ones. One is if there's no other person who can do it, then he should try to do the right cut, if it's a cut or the right treatment and not overdo, not do extra, which will be a, a violation of Makea Vivimo. Or if the father requests it, if the father says, I trust you more than I trust anyone else, and I want you to do it for me, and I am Eichel, the extra that might happen that you will do, then it is permissible. But otherwise, if there's someone else who is as good that can do it, and the father doesn't care who will do it, then it's preferable that the son shouldn't do it, but rather someone else should do it. So that is if we talk about surgery. But even if we talk about simpler procedures, let's say to put an IV in the father's uh, arm. In order to put the IV, you must draw a little blood to be sure that you are in the right vein. Drawing the blood is a chavala, which is a chiyuv misa. So again, preferable that someone else should put an IV rather than the son, unless again, there is no one else who can do it, or that the father prefers that he should do. An interesting discussion is about IM injection. Usually when you do intramuscular injection, there's no blood. If there's no blood, there's no definition of choive. And then even if there is someone else, but it's more convenient for the son to do it, he can do it at home and doesn't need to, to bring someone or go somewhere, I am or subcutaneous is permissible for a son to do, even if by accident, sometimes a little blood comes out, it wasn't intended and usually it's not so and it's preferable. Therefore, it would be permissible for the son as a physician or as a nurse uh, to do it. So these are some of the exceptions. Another exception can be that it's very costly. Let's say that another surgeon would demand a big amount of money and the son would do it obviously for free. Even if we say Michel Av and the father has to pay the son the surgery, but the son usually will forego uh, the expenses that he needs, maybe institutional expenses would be there, but certainly much less than a first class surgeon who will take a lot of money. So that's a debate whether that falls into the category that the son will still be allowed to do it, although there's someone else who can do it, but the someone else is much more expensive. Another situation <clears throat> comes up <clears throat> when something happens on Shabbos and the son is at home and he can do the treatment without Chilul Shabbos. He doesn't have to drive, he doesn't have to drive back, he's there and he can give the treatment. But there's someone else who can do the treatment, but it is not related to the treatment itself. It's related for someone else, something else that is violating Shabbos. Are we allowed to prefer violating Shabbos by someone else rather than the son who is available that should do it. So again, all falls into this distinction between a chabole on a father or a mother, <coughs> which is a chi of misa, therefore we are so careful, <coughs> as opposed to someone else that it's only an isula. Uh, now, some say the Gemara talks about an example where a splinter 
was in the father's skin and someone has to pull out the splinter. And the Gemara said <clears throat> that if by pulling out the splinter, blood will come out, then the son is not allowed to do it. Someone else has to do it because he's doing a chavole, although he means well and he's treating the father, but the chi of Misa is worse for a father than it would be for, for another person. But that seems to be an example that really everyone, anyone else can do it. It's not a major thing that it's how to find someone to do. If we are talking about a real procedure, maybe the Gemara didn't intend it at all to make any distinction between <clears throat> the father, a father-son or a foreign a physician, because in this circumstance, the, the procedure is a medical required procedure that there are fewer people that could do it. To pull out a, a splinter, everyone in the street can do it. You don't need an, an expert, it's easy to find. If it becomes more complicated, perhaps it doesn't have to be that far that there's no one else at all and only then can the father do it. Thank you. So, Again, these are examples of situations where uh, I think many physicians encounter when they want to do good for their, for their parent, but uh, we have to take into account that uh, that might be problematic. Another example which frequently is encountered is a diabetic parent that you need to draw bloods in order to test the glucose before a meal. And to bring each time before every meal, someone from outside in order to test the, the level of glucose is very bothersome. So here again, some of the post say, although you are drawing blood, you're taking out blood, but it's done for a good purpose. But here the requirement is that the father should ask to do it. That adds to the uh, to the uh, header that the son could do it because it's combining the tsar of finding every time someone else to come in to do it, plus the fact that the father is agreeable to do it. So we have to know this halachas because they are, I think, very frequently encountered in in our uh, generation where parents live much longer than they used before. And the longer we live, the more degenerative diseases we encounter and uh, malignancies and so on. And that is quite, free, quite often a situation where a, a child who is a doctor, everyone expects him to take care of the father rather than to run and find someone else, which is not always the right thing to do halachically. So to sum up, I think that uh, the four mitzvahs related to parents, Ibud Avim, Mora Avim, Makea Vivimo, and Maklea Vivimo, Makle is either Mekalel, a word for Mekalel cursing the, the parent, or Makle Milashon Kal, which is to humiliate. So you're not allowed to humiliate and you're not allowed to curse. So all these unusual uh, behaviors towards a father, which in normal circumstances, I assume everyone understands and everyone does it gladly, becomes a real challenge when a parent becomes ill mentally or physically, and there are so many questions that come up, how to handle such a parent. Thank you. We have time for one question, if uh, anybody has. We're good. Okay. Um, Rabbi Steinberg will be the, uh, Rabbi Steinberg. Thank you, Rabbi Steinberg. Um, we, uh, we're going to move on to our next uh, um, topic. Um, we're going to be talking about the concept of position burnout. And without further ado, Rabbi Glatt. Can I have the AB projector for this? Thank you.
So I'll begin by, first of all, thanking again, Rabbi Kelman and Dr. Friedman and the, everybody for making this such a wonderful, wonderful Shabbos and conference. And <clears throat> the prescription for physician burnout is Torah in Motion Conference Q monthly. So that's what we're gonna to try to talk about. It's an interesting subject, which I have almost no qualifications from from a, from a physician point of view other than experience, but I'd like to pose the answers to this from a more halachic point of view, from a Torah perspective, which I think the Torah has a lot to say about everything, but specifically about physician burnout. Okay, I'm going to have to ask you to please progress. This up. Okay, so that's the usual stuff. I have to spend 10 minutes on each slide. We're going to be in trouble. Okay, so why am I giving this presentation? Again, it's an important presentation, and it's not caused by a virus. So we can start off from there. But it's a real issue because I, I do think that there is not a single person in this room, whether they're a physician or the spouse of a physician or have ever dealt with a physician that has not encountered physician burnout. It's difficult for a person to walk in every single day and encounter every single patient as if this was your first patient in medical school. When you, were, you couldn't sleep that night, I'm going to see my first patient tomorrow. And it was such a privilege and such an honor. And you were so excited. And how many of us feel that same level of excitement, which we should feel for every single patient encounter that we have. And we have to try to deal with that. So I think this is really a medical shiloh, but it has a lot of answers. And most of us look like that. And we often take certain things for granted. We're supposed to be unhappy. We're supposed to not enjoy work. And that I think is a terrible thing. And I tell physicians, especially the older ones, if you reach that stage where you're burnt out, retire if you can, because you're not doing your patients a favor and you're not that, uh, required to do your job. Uh, the cemeteries are filled with people that were indispensable. So it's important to realize if you can't do the job right, a Kodesh Baruch doesn't want you to do the job anymore. And that's something that's important. And for, for people that cannot get that excitement into taking care of a patient and that excitement really translates into, I'm going to do a great job, not just intellectually and stimulating, but I'm going to give that patient the absolute best care that I possibly can. If we can't do that, we're hurting people. And that's Kabbalah, as Rabbi Starnberg just talked about. That's not allowed for anybody. So let's talk first about what science has to say. And there are now studies coming out talking a little bit about physician burnout. And it's important for us to realize that burnout is something that you're going to have. And just how you deal with it is what we have to know about. So physician burnout, look at some of the definitions, state of emotional, mental, physical exhaustion, prolonged chronic workplace stress, detachment, cynicism, effectiveness, reduced personal accomplishment, exhaustion, depersonalization, reduced job satisfaction. Lousy physician. That's what that says. If you burn that, you're going to be a lousy physician. Impact the well-being of patient care and all of health care. Big deal if you're burnt out and you're a cashier at the bank. So the customers will be a little bit upset. But if you miss a diagnosis because you're burnt out, you didn't have a chance to go through the chart the way you should have, you miss taking a proper history because you're at the end of the day and you're just exhausted and tired, you're given 10 minutes to see a patient instead of a half an hour to see a patient and you can't do the right job, well, that leads to lousy care. And that's something that nobody in this room wants, increases medical errors, and it requires attention and support. So we take care of our patients properly. So let's look at what makes physicians unhappy. So I like this quote, dissatisfaction is inevitable. Collecting unhappiness is a choice. We're all gonna be unhappy. The boss is unhappy, the workers are unhappy. There's gonna be things that make us unhappy. Coach Buckle set up the world that way. We're gonna have challenges. How you approach those challenges do you gain from those challenges? Do you become a better person from those challenges? That's why HaKadosh Baruch gives us challenges and we have to make the best of them. So <coughs> cutting my hours down to 24 seven. It's a joke. I wanna show you a study that was just published. If you wanna follow 
your primary care. A lot of people in this room are primary care. If you want to follow and be a good primary care doctor, this study shows you need 27 hours a day to appropriately spend time with patients and giving them all the cancer screening protocol guidelines, smoking cessation, uh, substance abuse prevention, all, all the guidelines to make sure their blood pressure is taken care of properly. If you really want to follow all the guidelines, they calculated in this published study that was uh, in July of 2022, that you would need 27 hours a day to follow the guidelines. So what does that tell you about guidelines? So not every guideline is a good guideline. They may be medically correct, but they're not necessarily appropriate for every patient. And we as physicians cannot let inappropriate paperwork guidelines and, and regulatory guidelines drive us out of medicine and drive us to perform bad medicine in the zeal to perform good medicine. And that is going to take a lot more than a conversation in this room, but each of us has to figure out which guidelines we need to stress on which patients. And it's not going to work for everybody to do everything. Let's look at one study. Physician burnout. Netscape actually did a survey of 10,000 physicians, a large study. And what did they respond? Oops. Skip. How do I go back? No. Can I, I say to go back two, three slides? Okay. Now I'll go one slide forward. Okay. So they had 10,000 physicians. The majority of the doctors were too burnt out to complete the study. But they did get 10,000 physicians. They, it was a 10-minute online survey, so it's not too, too comprehensive. People don't like to take long surveys and get a skewed uh, result. I'm not going to claim this is the most scientifically accurate study, but it's decent, and it has a lot of people that responded. A lot of different specialties. Yeah, there's always sampling errors, marginal, uh, marginal errors for confidence. Yeah, 100%. Not perfect study, but it gives us a lot of good information. What did this study show? Which physicians are the most burned out? <clears throat> Primary care. Now, you can lump primary care into different categories, but let's look at the top ones. Emergency medicine, they're dealing a lot with it. Lots of new patients, lots of new problems. Internal medicine, pediatrics, OB, dealing lots of new patients. Infectious diseases, have to throw that in there. Lots of new patients. It burns you out to have lots of patients. People that are doing uh, what they call the concierge medicine, and they have 12 patients in their panel. Uh, each of them pays them $100,000 to take care of them. I don't think those physicians are burnt out. <laughs> Maybe they are. I don't know. I'm not one of them. The more patients that you're seeing, the more that you're being asked to process, certainly it correlates with who's going to get burned out. But again, nobody's not burned out. Even the, the people, the pathologists, or maybe a more set job, a nine to five type of job, although there are always fresh uh, sections that need to be looked at in the OR, they're on call too. I'm not in any way being pejorative about any one specialty versus the other, but you see that there's a spray in terms of who is getting burned out and who is not but everybody's getting burned out. And this is an interesting slide, male or females, who's getting burned out more? So the women felt that they were more burned out. And I explained this to my residents in a totally politically incorrect way, but I think it's 100% correct. Every single person that has two X chromosomes in this room will agree with me. And every single person with an XY chromosome is gonna say he's right, but I'm not gonna agree with him. And that's because women have two jobs and men have one job, right? The woman physician and the male physician, they each work 10 hours a day. The woman comes home, cooks up or does the laundry, takes care of the kids. The husband comes home and maybe hopefully sits with the safe for most of the time. And then it's a 50-50 job. Then, that's, then, then the man has two jobs too. But if the man is going home and watching Netflix all night, so then he owes on one job. The woman has two jobs. So when I try to give this talk to Balabatim, I tell them that this is a chiv in Torah for the husband to help the wife out. A man has an obligation to treat his wife with tremendous respect, telling her to do the laundry while I'm sitting around doing nothing, telling her to cook supper and clean up afterwards while I'm doing nothing, is not what the Torah says. Is a halachic imperative, not just smart advice for a very, very good, healthy marriage, which of course the Torah always gives a smart advice for a very healthy, good marriage. So, I think that's the reason why they didn't explore the reasons, but I'm sure the additional work that a female physician does versus a male physician around the house probably contributes to that. So 
the solution for the female physicians is that their husbands, whether they're physicians or not, should go and help them out. Okay. What contributes most to physicians saying head burnout in this study of almost 10,000 physicians? Too many bureaucratic tests. I think we all would agree to that. Government regulations, silly stuff that none of us think is any of importance. That drives us nuts. Should drive everybody nuts. It's, it's a waste of our time to do things that we don't think are important. Unfortunately, sometimes we have to. Some of the other things here are also obvious. Some of them is not gonna be much change, insufficient conversation. I never met a physician said that I'm overpaid. Uh, even the ones that are paid very, very nicely. Um, everybody feels that they're worth more than what they're paid. That's probably not gonna be something that I can give you an easy answer to. Too many work hours, uh, lack of control, autonomy, are things that we do have some control over. Um, there are some things here that we have no control over, but we have control over how we deal with them. I'll talk about this more from a halachic point of view soon. How severe is your burnout? So this study showed that it really is bothersome to a lot of people. Severe, strong impact, moderate impact. It's almost three quarters of all the physicians. You only have a small percentage of physicians that say, nah, burnout doesn't impact me. And I think those are lawyers. I think those are the people that fill out these forms without really reading them. And I can't imagine, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe there's a small percentage of physicians that are totally unimpacted by this concept of burnout. But I do think that the vast majority of physicians are encountering these over-regulations, are encountering doing things that they don't feel any purpose to. Uh, they're seeing too many patients in too little time. So I think that applies to most physicians. I, I don't know any physician in my hospital that wouldn't agree to that. And I don't think we overwork our physicians. I don't think that we uh, treat our physicians in a, in a bad way. I think we treat them very well, but I think that most physicians are gonna be feeling these sensations. Most important, has physician burnout had a negative effect in your relationship? And two to one, that impacts shalom bias. That's something we in Halakha have to be very concerned about. Uh, a rub does a lot of pastoral work. A rub's a psychiatrist, psychologist, he's a social worker. We're dealing with a tremendous amount of unhappy balabatim. So physician burnout isn't the only type of burnout. There's legal burnout, there's accountant burnout. I'm sure it applies to all other fields as well, but we're here going to focus on physician burnout. But the solutions to what I'm saying are going to be applicable to any type of burnout. And it affects shalom bias. That's something that we have to pay a tremendous amount of attention to. There's nothing essentially more important than shalom bias. Unhappy couples make for unhappy children, make for less spirituality in the house, make for all sorts of problems in the house. Doesn't mean if you have a perfect, wonderful marriage that everything's gonna be wonderful in your children and everything's a wonderful financial world, but it's a great place to start. And that should be the focus of every single family to have shalom bodies in the house. And that's a large number. So how did the physicians say they cope with it? So some of these are halachic answers that we'll talk about momentarily as well. But exercise and talking with friends and family are things that halacha tells us about. And I'll go through that in a moment. I wanna just finish off with some of these slides. So in administration, we often wonder, you know, how come all of our great solutions aren't working? And that's because I don't think we communicate very well. And I think that's part of the problem that physician burnout is that there's a lack of communication. And one of the best ways is to properly communicate. Just one other quick study. I'll just give you some of the summation of it. Things are getting worse, not getting better. The first study, is in agreement with the second study. The second study has though a year difference to compare between 21 and 22. So they notice that doctors are not less, but more pressured. Okay, and this is all during COVID, so you can't blame everything on COVID. We tend to blame everything on COVID. You can't blame this on COVID. COVID absolutely contributes, but I don't think everything's going away now that quote COVID is gone. So these are real problems that are worsened certainly by COVID, but not independently unrelated. They are absolutely important. This is disappointing and sad. The physicians aren't happy. They don't think medicine's rewarding. Rav Asher Weiss, Shlita, always says that if he couldn't be a Russian sheep, he'd be a doctor. It's the next best thing, so to say. You're helping people. We do a mitzvah a second. You know, you're, you're a world famous lawyer. You know, you're a world-class accountant. You're doing wonderful things, important things. You're not doing a mitzvah every second. 
A physician, by definition, is doing your mitzvah every single second, at least bikur cholim, v'hatol recha kamocha, gemilus chasodim, rapo yirape. You're doing a mitzvah every second of your life, every second of your professional job. You should want to stay extra at work because when you come home, you're stopping to doing a mitzvah every second. We should ask for more work, more patience. <laughs> Physicians don't feel appreciated. When I was growing up, oh, the doctor, right? <laughs> the doctor. Now you're a doctor. Oh, why do you go to medicine? You know, what, you weren't bright enough to go into finance? Right? It used to be the opposite, right? The brightest kids in the class, oh, he's going to be a doctor. Oh, that guy who's a billionaire now, well, he's a schlepper. You know, what is he going to do? We don't feel appreciated. Look at this terrible number. Only 16% would ask their children to go into medicine. That's a shame. I love medicine. I would have encouraged any of my children to go into medicine. I would encourage my grandchildren to go into medicine. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful field. Doctors don't feel that way. So what are some of the answers? So this was a recent New York Times article that says doctors aren't burned out. They're demoralized. And this is exactly the way we felt in Mitzrayim. Okay, so if you have an hour to solve a problem, spend 55 minutes thinking about it. And that's what I'd like to do, not 55 minutes. I only have about 15 minutes left. But I'd like to spend a little time thinking about the problem and looking at it through the eyes and the prism of Chazal. There are effective ways to address these real issues. I didn't say easy, but there are effective ways to address these issues. What does the Torah have to say about burnout? So first and foremost, Chosh Birosho, Yasok Torah. Something's bothering you, go learn Torah. Torah is a universal anecdote, a antidote. The Torah has unbelievable power of healing. I don't know anybody who's burnt out from Torah. There's not a single Rosh Yeshiva in the world that says, ah, oh, I can't learn a minute more. Right? You have the great, great, great Gedolim, who, by the way, are the happiest people in the world. There's no burnout amongst Russia Yeshiva. I would never be asked to give this to Russia <laughs> in a koilo. There's no burnout because the Torah is matok. It is sweet, it is pleasant. I always ask this question, how many pieces of chocolate cake can you eat? So I can have about 15 or 20. So I don't know, maybe you can match me. But even me, after 15 or 20 pieces, will say that's enough chocolate cake. But somebody who's into Torah, there's no such thing as I'm satiated with Torah. You cannot have too much Torah. And the psukim support this. It says, the Kovei Hashem, some pronounce it the Koyei Hashem, Yachlifu Choach, famous Pasuk in Yeshaya. Yarutsu velo yigo, yachu velo yofu. If you have belief in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, if you spend as much time as you can with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you will not be tired. Right? Yachlifu Choach, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give you renewed strength. This is a haptach, this is a Pasuk in Navi. You run, Yarutsu, velo yigo, you will not be tired. You'll go, you'll go, below you're not going to feel faint. The person who places primacy in his life in Torah will be a happier person, be a less burnt out person. I know many physicians who are exhausted and tired and they live for their Tuesday night to Marisha. They live for Minyan in the morning. They live for their Dafyomi. They live for their Harusa. It revitalizes you. And this works for women as well. There are so many wonderful learning opportunities for women today. It is an underutilized, extremely effective measure to prevent and treat burnout. The Torah says so. Hush, the Rosha, you have a headache? Translate a headache anywhere you want. Doesn't mean literally a headache. You have mental fatigue. Hush, the Rosha. Yasok, the Torah. That is a fundamental idea that I guarantee you, if you haven't tried it, you will appreciate it when you look forward to something, a vacation or a shia or a chavrusa. That's the best way to re-energize and revitalize. What else does the Gemara have to say? The Gemara Yuma, Machlokas Ravami Ravasi. 
Daga, uh, not in the clock, it's a statement, both of them made. Rami and Ravasi were first generation on the Rome and Eretz Yisrael. Great, great individuals, but dealt with a lot more problems than we have to deal with. Daga Belevish, Yashchema. The Pasuk tells us if you have worry in your heart, do this Yashchema. What does Daga mean? Sirashi tells us, Pachach Yadoy, Yal Hefzid, Shun Gabar, and you go, be a something bad company. It's going to be hard to make the same income this year as last year because they're asking me to see more patients in less time. Uh, the government's reimbursing me less. They're ratcheting down everything. Daga, you have worries, financial worries. Well, I make my RVUs. I don't know if you have RVUs here in Canada. In America, the holy grail is RVUs. How many RVUs did you obtain? You would get a certain amount of RVUs for a history of physical, a certain amount for doing a certain diagnostic test. So if you meet your RVUs, you get your salary. If you don't meet your RVUs, they can lower your salary. Just think of it. If you don't know what RVUs are, just how many patients did you see? You see 100 patients, they make your salary. You see 90, you lose 10%. You make 110, they give you a couple of bucks extra. Daga, you're worried about making a prognosis. You're worried about, will I reach the goals that somebody has set for me? So, Yashchena, what does that mean? So, one, one of them said, one, either Ravami or Ravasi said, Kadamar, Yashchena Midato. It was Royal Olasir Daito Midato. So, get rid of it. Try not to think about it. Easier said than done. I think the next answer is a better practical one. Kadamar, Yashchena Liacherim. Yashapro so Liacherim Yakolo. Book it over with somebody. Any good psychiatrist will tell you that talking things out is much better for a person. Keeping it inside, locked up, never good. Having somebody you can talk these things out to is a connect, though. That's why God created spouses. The women know that. The men don't know that. You have to talk. Talking is one of the best ways to release tension. Having a person that you can absolutely tell the most deepest, most confidential things to the Torah tells us it's a great idea to do that. Talk out your problems with somebody. Spouse usually is a person you'd be able to tell the most innermost feelings. If unfortunately you're in a situation where you don't have that, one of the line, whatever the reason, or it just doesn't work that way. You love each other, but you just don't have that type of relationship. So find the best friend of the same gender. Find somebody that you can talk with, take a walk with them. I love to see the women in our neighborhood in the shul walking together, they talk, they walk, it's healthy. It is a tension releaser. Much better when the husband and wife walk. One of the things, I, I think Baruch Hashem were married for 42 years, or almost 43 years. And Baruch Hashem, one of the best things we've done is we start walking together every night. We've been doing this for you know, a decade or two already. It's wonderful. No phones, unless we jointly agree we're going to call the kids. No phones. You shut them up. We used to not take them, but now you got to count how many steps you take. We would say, oh, no, we have to go back and hit the phone. <laughs> it doesn't count on Shabbos. The, the only negative that Shabbos has is that you can't carry your phone. Not to have it on, just so it counts those steps. I feel like I wasted. I went to show six times this Shabbos, and the phone thinks I was sitting in bed. So you, you got you to talk, find somebody to talk it out with. I will guarantee you it will help your marriage, even if you have a great marriage make your marriage better. And it's just a release. Torah tells us this is a good thing to do. Sicha, talk it over with somebody. Then the other says, Yisichem midaito, the mefik l'kro mitashte, he takes it out of the normal content, he shouldn't be takone. So he actually yells b'chol and yana. Not everybody has somebody like this. So go and do it this way. It's the best eights if you can. Tehillim, ibn du'as Hashem b'simcha, Get excited about something. If you can't get excited about your work, but you should get excited about, you, you need to find something else that will keep you happy. And there's nothing better than Yiddishkeit. I know people that would never miss a minion. I know people that would never miss their Shia. I know people that would never miss a, a religious activity, Tomchei Shabbos, the packing for the, the bags. That gets them excited. Make sure you have something in your life that gets you excited. Famous Mitzrayim analogy. Moshe, Moshe, Faisal didn't listen to Moshe. Moshe, I'm taking you out. They all should have said, hey, where are we going? They didn't listen to Moshe. They were incapable of listening to Moshe. They listen to what some of the Mepharshim say, why they couldn't do this. This is burnout 101. The Bukhar Shor says, 
Lo Salmon Lay Bidvara. They were so pressed. They were so out of it, they couldn't hear the message. They couldn't hear the message. They were so depressed. Others say they were so immersed. The Birchas Asher, he says, Lo Shalohaminu. Not that they didn't believe Moshe Rabbeinu. Im Hayamunu Shaminu. They believed in Lo His Gadru Al Hargoshas Mitsukasa. They weren't able to overcome their burnout. Their physical difficulties were so overwhelming to them that they couldn't relate to the unbelievable message. The Chibi Yisera says, Lo Shamu Moshe They didn't have vision. They didn't think about the long term. They don't think about today. It was so hard today. Think about every mitzvah that you did today. Every patient that you saw was a huge eternal zuchus that you have. Think about the lives that you impacted. Yeah, you had a tough day, but wow, you made 25 people have wonderful days. And now if you gave them bad news, you broke it to them sympathetically. You hopefully helped them to get better. Think about what you did rather than how difficult it was. That's what Kaisel couldn't do. Many, many more. I, I'm running out of time. I won't go into every one of the chazal on this pasuk. Mikol Tzeruch Me'avad Kashah is a sheer in physician burnout. And it's kedai to read every one of the mafarshim that you can get your hands on because everyone is gold. And the Guraya is the last one I'll tell you on this. He said that they were basically so preoccupied with work that they couldn't enjoy anything. They couldn't think about anything else. Dog they were so involved with their work, caught up in the work, they couldn't spend any time on anything else. You got to have free time. You got to go to a conference. You got to go on a vacation, even if it's an hour. You got to get away. So that's what they're telling us. The pasuk I mentioned before from Yeshaya. Won't talk about that again now. The next pasuk from Tehillim is critically important. Hashleich al Hashem. You're not in it alone. Throw your burden onto Hakadosh Baruch Hu. We are promised that Hakadosh Baruch Hu will carry it for us. Right? The pasuk of Tehillim, the the Mitzudas David says, "Batachalo." You can take it to the bank that if you give Hashem your pekel to carry, He'll carry it for you. Uyakel masecha meolecha. He will lighten your load. You got a partner. Right? You have a, a physical partner. So listen, I'm swamped today. Can you take some of my patients? Sure. I, I can't make it tonight to be on call. Can you cover for me? I got a sim I got to go. Sure. You have a partner. You got a better partner. You have a Kaddish Baruch Hu. How many people stop in the middle of a really hard, tough day and say, Shem, help me out here? You know what a tefillah does? We don't utilize that. I, I feel bad for the secular act, uh, atheists and uh, you know the people that don't have somebody to throw their package onto. But we got somebody that we can help us Minute by minute, we don't take advantage of it. The Radak says, We have again, I have tocha. Lo ye tenli ola mot letzadik. God will not let the righteous person collapse. Lo yani chehu li olam. He will never let us get burned out. Just got to trust him. We don't take advantage of Tvila. We don't take advantage of knowing that we got a big brother, that somebody that can help us out. You got a super duper partner that will always pick you up and help you out. We don't take advantage of that. And I pointed out the Pasuk for Mishle before as well. And I think bottom line, when push comes to shove, the Warren Ketushi tells us a very interesting idea. If you want to do good, and you really want to do good, it's not here, yeah, I say I want to do good, which doctor says it does want to do good. But if all you're really thinking about, wow, that's a, you know, that's a cabbage that walked in, that's another 5,000 bucks in my pocket. Oh, there's an there's a interventional procedure over there, that's another 5,000 bucks in my pocket. If that's your thought, then you're not such a good doctor. But if you have machshava, there's a sick person coming into my room now. I'm going to do everything I can at Kodesh Baruch to make that person better. And then you don't. You tried, but you didn't make that person better. So in this world, your quality report will be a failure on that patient. But in the real report card, in HaKadosh Baruch's report card, you had good intention, you had a good heart, you wanted to help, and Nebuch, you weren't able to do so. God, you got a check mark. You got your RVUs in Shemaim, even though you didn't get your RVUs here on this world. Amar Vasi, Afilu Chashav Adam Lasos Mitzvah, Vinenas Lawasa. 
you wanted to go to Mincha and you planned enough time to go to Mincha and suddenly there's a crash on the road, traffic stops, you stop and you miss the minion. So you feel terrible, you miss the minion, you dive in, you walk out of car, go outside the road, you dive in, feel terrible. And then you're going to be 120, you go up to Shemai and say, ah, you remember that day? Credit, Mincha did see me, say, Rabbi, uh, God, you made a mistake, sorry, I wasn't, I wasn't at Mincha that day. He says, no, you were. But I wasn't. No, you were. You wanted to be. So in Shemayim, they don't really care if you showed up or not. It's the intention. They want you to want to go to Mincha. Getting there, no, that's an, another very nice thing. But the wanting to is what you get paid for in Shemayim. And we all want to work as physicians to the best of our ability. And we can't lose sight of that by getting burnt out. And then that's what was, even if you weren't able to, because you are a little bit tired. You're exhausted. You had a tough day. But nevertheless, mala kasu kilo If we keep that in mind, I think it's a fantastic way for a person to become a better doctor. And we have to remember, why do we become physicians? To do a mitzvah. And that is priceless. Quickly to go through some other practical suggestions, which the Torah agrees with. Exercise. I mentioned already about that. Finding time to do things that are important to you that even may not be Torah. I love to play basketball. You got to find time to play sports or do something if you like to knit, if you like to cook, if you like to whatever. As long as a kosher thing to do, the more of a, a mitzvah that kosher thing to do. I play basketball. I say, and then I so smash somebody in the jaw. No, I say, I say, try to get the rebound. You can turn everything into a hechshah mitzvah. One of my rabbis said such a smart thing. So before you go to sleep at night, instead of yeah, six to eight hours, whatever, four to seven hours, whatever it is that you get to sleep every night, you say, this should be the way, Akosh Baruch, that I will come refreshed in the morning. You just turn six hours of dead time into six hours of Heksha Mitzvah. So I can wake up tomorrow and say, Modani, with a, with a good feel. Exercise, there's studies to show you, I won't go into detail. Healthy people with not only clinical depression, but healthy people that just have some anxiety. It's a large study just published in the British Medical Journal. Largest balance was seen in addition to sick people and healthy individuals. Higher intensity physical activity was associated with greater improvements in symptoms. Again, not every one of us is a you know, world-class athlete. So play to the best of your ability. If it's a nice slow walk with your wife, with your husband, that's great. Do physical activity. Barbara says that's exciting also and good to do. Won't go into the details. Take time away. Even short amounts. Rabbi J, Q monthly Torah in motion conferences. That's the best answer. But if you can't get away, get away for a little bit. One of the best things to do is when you're eating lunch. So put earplugs in the air and listen to a, a shear. And say no calls, no interruptions except for true emergencies. Get away, even if it's in the middle of your office. Make sure that you take care of yourself. I, I know one job I switched from, I had like 150 days banked that I ended up losing <laughs> a vacation time. I said, I'm not going to let that happen again. That's crazy. You're not indispensable. Nobody is indispensable. Reduce the administrative burden. That's the you know, practical aids. Is figure out ways, with, maybe with chat, GPT, and AI, uh, my son keeps on telling me that there's so many things that they can automate now, all the routine billing stuff and things like that. Maybe there are ways with ChatGPT that you can do that will make your life burden some silly regulatory stuff, make it easier. Get other people to do the stuff that don't require a physician. It's much more cost effective for the government, the uh, hospital, the uh, employer to have a you know twenty dollar an hour person do the, some of that paperwork than you as a as a you know twenty five dollar an hour physician. And again, fight together. We sometimes we pit each other one against each other. That's the worst thing that we could possibly do. I mentioned before about communication. Tefillah works to communicate not only better with each other, but with our Kaddish Baruch Hu. I'm not going to ever fix the EMR. I'm not going to talk about that. Figure out what relaxes you. I gave a lot of generalities, but you know what relaxes you. And try to do that as much as you can. That will definitely work. And this will conclude with this slide. Don't ignore what's eating away at you. You know, we as physicians sometimes are fantastic at taking care of our patients 
and not taking care of ourselves. And I think that if you want to really take care of your patients, you will do a much better job if you take care of yourself. And the answer, the universal antidote, is more Judaism in your life. I mean, to Shiorim, doing things that the Torah says are nice and kosher to do in your free time, making time to do those Torah values and Torah activities, guaranteed, 100%, no side effects, 100% guarantee that it works. There's no medication that can make the same claim. Hashem is the perfect rofe. It says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the rofe chinam. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the rofe cholam. There's zero side effects. Zero side effects. I want to thank you all. I apologize. I'm going to catch a plane, so I can't stay for the next speakers. But it's been such a pleasure to be at this conference in Mirza Hashem. Uh, Rabbi Jay, uh, Dr. Laser, you are the antidote for physician burnout. Thank you very much, Rabbi Glatt. My stress level has gone up. Thank you. And my workload has gone up. So Q monthly is Seyf Chana Shalom. Have a wonderful, safe trip. And uh, Mir Tashem, we would look forward to seeing you again. Um, our next speaker will be Dr. Michelle Friedman, and she will be addressing uh, understanding and responding to trauma. Michelle. Okay, thank you, everybody, and it's really been a pleasure being here. Uh, Rabbi Glatt kind of um, set me up for talking about responding to chronic stress, because certainly the whole issue of physician burnout is one of really how do you deal with chronic stress? I'm not going to address that in, in the under the name more of secondary trauma, perhaps. But the bulk of my talk today is going to be about understanding and responding to trauma and catastrophe, either on a individual, but more on a communal level. And I wanna start off by just spending a few moments on the, what, what my definition of trauma is. And also that goes along with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and trauma and PTSD, I think, are words that are highly overused these days. You know, somebody, uh, I don't know, gets, uh, has a, bro a breakup of a romantic relationship. A teacher is mean. A workplace event is stressful. And people say, you know, I'm, I have PTSD. I'm really traumatized. Now, I'm not saying in any way that those are not important, painful, difficult experiences. But for our purposes today, what I'm talking about in terms of the word trauma and catastrophe are life-threatening, safety-threatening levels of danger. Um, and unfortunately, too many people, um, perhaps you know, more in Israel with the threats of terrorism, these days in the United States with the prevalence of gun violence, um, with suicides, um, which is not perhaps a threat to other people, but the, as I talked about yesterday, you know, and I, one, that's one of the examples that I, I'm basing my talk on, is the incident of a suicide in a high school is a tremendous sense of, like I used the word yesterday, the wrenching, the ripping of the fabric of a community, and that is a trauma for the community. So when I talk about PTSD, um, that's, that's what I'm talking about. And this is a huge field of PTSD. The co-author on the book um, that I published a couple of years ago is The Art of Jewish Pastoral Counseling, a, a Guide for All Faiths. My co-author is Dr. Rachel Yehuda, who's sort of like, not the queen, but the empress of PTSD. Um, so I've, I've learned a lot from her. And it, as I said, it is a vast field, which is a very important one. But the main point I want to make about that is that um, interpersonal violence results in more PTSD. Now, God forbid, if somebody is caught in a tsunami or a plane crash or something like that, of course, it causes enormous amounts of stress and it's a traumatic experience. But the experience of violence at the hands of others is a whole different level of stress. So people, and you're all dealing with patients who are survivors of rape, 
of gun violence, of some kind of interpersonal, whatever it is, violence, the levels of PTSD are, it is much higher. And I think, you know, you can think about that on a, whatever, a philosophic level, that other humans could cause this level of this kind of trauma, horribleness to another being is different than say a force of nature. Um, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna leave you there. Now, in terms of just kind of signs and symptoms of PTSD, like I said, after exposure to some kind of extreme stressor or traumatic event that's of a life-threatening nature, what people will complain about is, or what they'll describe if you ask them sometimes, because they're not going to necessarily come out with this, but if you know what to ask about, you can find out the re-experiencing of the, of the event. We see this in soldiers after combat, um, intrusive thoughts, flashbacks, nightmares, avoidance of things that might remind them of the event, hyperarousal, as I said before, sleep disturbance, irritability, difficulty concentrating, vigilance. It's gonna really intrude in people's lives in a very profound way. Okay, that's PTSD. The, it, and it's striking, people who are exposed to let's say an interpersonal violent event, not everybody develops PTSD. Probably a quarter to a third of people do. Why they do, and that's a much larger neuroendocrine hyperarousal type of state. That's what my colleague Rachel Yehuda has studied. Um, and I'm, I'm not gonna go into that at all. What I want to spend the rest of my time on, and I do want to have a little time in my, I'll try to shorten my half an hour because I know other people don't want to be squished out by everybody leaving for their airport or whatever it is. Um, I do want to have some, some time for Q&A. Um, is what can you do? What can we do when God forbid there is an event um, where there is a need for a response? Um, and I'm going to use two events just to sort of anchor. These are things that I have been personally involved with, so I'm, I'm kind of using them as reference points. Well, there are actually three. One was several years ago, the JCC in Manhattan, there was a horrific event where a babysitter murdered two children while the mother was over at the JCC. This was in their apartment, but it was over at the JCC picking up a kid from a swim lesson. And this was obviously devastating, horrible. The babysitter was psychotic. I'm not gonna, but the, you, know, you can imagine that the sense of of horror in the community, the sense of danger, all of the attendant questions, which you can uh, relate to other kinds of situations. God forbid a school shooting, you know, of which there have been too many in the United States. Is my child ever safe? What do we do? You know, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so the, the, the executive director of the JCC called me up and said, what do I do? My parents are totally freaked out. The staff is freaked out. You know, there's all of these sensible things that you do. Of course, they're, they're going to go you know, to the funeral of the child, comfort the family. But what about the rest of the community? So I'm going to let's just hold that one. And more recently, unfortunately, one of my musmachen, who's a teacher in a high school in Atlanta, um, had the su I referred to this the other day, had the suicide of the school, had the suicide of a student in the school. And this is, you know, what do you, how do you, how do you tell this information to the rest of the kids, to the rest of the school community, not just the kids, the teachers, administration, everybody is really traumatized. What do you do? So I'm going to use those as two kind of signal events, and you could apply this, like I said, I'm not going to say God forbid every single time, you know, to a, a terrorist event, to any, any kind of deeply traumatic, catastrophic situation. I am talking about an extreme degree here, but unfortunately, there's too many of them. I think the most important thing is there needs to be somebody who takes charge. And like, if you know, if you have sort of a blueprint of what you can do to be helpful, you don't have to be a mumcha, an expert in trauma and catastrophe to do this, but you sort of have to have a blueprint. When my colleague called me up from the JCC, it's not like I've done this before, thank God. Um, but I said like, okay, what you need to do is you need to convene a group, a group that has a beginning time and an end time parents, anybody can come. There will be facilitators there. It's actually better to have two because this can be really overwhelming, you know, for one person to convene. And, it, you know, this is this is necessarily, not necessarily going to happen in a Jewish environment, but if it is a Jewish environment, actually in any environment, I think it's great to have one mental health person and one spiritual person in the JCC situation, a rabbi, but somebody who could provide, you know, just even talk, 
like just thinking about the presentation that we just heard, a spiritual support, just that sense of a person being there who can handle, can absorb all of the, how could this happen? How, you know, the whole Scarba Onesh aspect, how could a good God let a terrible thing like this happen? And the only answer is, I don't know, but we can sit here together and try to think about it, try to understand that we don't know the answer to this, but we can honestly absorb it. I think really the, the, less, the least helpful thing is to try to cancel out that kind of questioning, to sort of push it away. It's really important in this kind of holding group environment that I really suggest that people create, and it's not hard to do. You gotta like pick a place, to find a time because there needs to be an endpoint. The facilitators need to know when the endpoint is, and so do the people that come. And so it's going to be people who linger, who need extra help, who need private support, whatever. That's like a separate thing. But I think convening that and finding people who can hold the group does. And you don't have to be experts. Usually, people have some sort of group experience. is going to is going to really make a difference. It's important in this kind of thing to encourage expression of feeling. Nothing is wrong to talk about. You're angry, you're hurt, you're scared. Um, you know, you feel like, how could, I don't know, like, like, well, what did those parents, you know, did they, did they do a background check on that babysitter? Whatever comes to mind. Like people can say what they want. Now, the, the group leaders might need, the facilitators need to contain it, to work it, you know, whatever it happens to be. I mean, not everything is like, is good. you're going to follow up or encourage a deeper discussion. But I think that the allowing people to express and to normalize that yeah, people have all sorts of responses in terrible situations. And you know, I used the expression yesterday, and I use it all the time with my students of taking your own emotional pulse. Like with you as a facilitator, you know, as a physician, as a social worker, as a person who can kind of convene such a group. Uh, and I and I can't tell, I can't say enough how important that is. I mean, one of the things I would say for physician stress is, you know, I'm, I'm as you've heard already before, I'm a big believer in group support. Nobody understands it like people who've been there um, but you've got to take care of yourself as well you got to pay attention like wow when am I feeling like my pulse is racing you know like I'm really feeling more more like uh like 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 distressed about what this person that person's more in trouble you know where shall I delve more where shall where do where do people need comfort because comfort and the sense of safety and certainly for children you know like following the school shooting or following some kind of and you know in, like saying this is this is a relatively rare event it is a terrible event. Like I said yesterday about suicide, it's still a relatively rare event. And what we're going to try to do is X, Y, or Z to make, to help people feel safer, you know, whatever it happens to be. And that is really important, you know, emphasizing safety, especially for children. One of the most, while I'm on, on that, I'm going to say um, limit exposure to news. When there is a big public, well, everything is covered by the news, but people can get into like, wow, we really saw this. I mean, most people in this room are certainly old enough to remember 9-11. Like, yeah, just turn off the TV. Um, you have to stop. And now, obviously, you know, with the constant flow of information on devices, I think one of the most important pieces of advice we can tell people is turn it off stop following it. You don't, you know, whatever you think you need to know, you can get it in a compressed thing. Turn off a bombardment of the, of the event, you know, all of the, all of the ancillary kinds of things that people sort of get hooked on in a kind of weird voyeuristic way, as though more information is somehow going to mitigate you know, the horror of the event, it's actually going to do the opposite. It's going to be a kind of constant traumatization, you know, and, and, and this sort of digging in of that pain. I would say, and I really want to emphasize this, and this is something that you all have done and will continue to do with people that you care about, patients, family members, after a terrible event, or really any, I'm talking about trauma, catastrophe in this talk, but getting back to normal routine is the most important thing. This was mentioned earlier in this weekend, and it's so profoundly true. People need to, kids need to go back to school. That's really, I mean, we saw this with COVID, like the devastation 
obviously it was intended to prevent infection, but we are reaping the sad consequences of the disruption you know, of kids from their school life, which everybody needs to get up in the morning and like, what do I do after I drink my, you know, whatever, coffee, tea, hot chocolate, oranges, water, nothing. Um, but what do, you, what do I do? Like, what is my schedule of the day? And for children, especially, school is absolutely critical. You know, for us grownups, it's work or whatever, you know, our usual routine is. People really need, Robert right, Glad just talked about this, physical exercise. People need to feel their, their connection to their bodies and they need to feel, and this is really important in the group, that it's oh, not only okay, but it's necessary to go on living and not feeling guilty about, about that, about having that gift of life when somebody that you cared about was just struck down in some horrible way. And there's other people perhaps closer to that epicenter of suffering that are suffering more, maybe that's you, but you're still intact and you could still laugh at a joke or enjoy a muffin or whatever it is. People can feel enormously guilty in the wake of a trauma catastrophe, you know, for that gift of life. And that's something that I think that if we can just say those words, you know, Rabbi Glad just talked about this, the power of saying things is enormous. And just anticipating, you know, people might be feeling guilty that they're going to walk out of here and enjoy the sunshine, or you're looking forward to, wow, you know, I don't know, the, uh, your, your, the, epi the last episode of your TV show, like people could be thinking about that in the middle of the group, but anticipating that, I mean, they'll feel like terribly guilty, like, wow, I'm going to find out what happened on succession this week, you know, and here I am, this terrible thing just happened, but we do think like that. We humans, you know, try to move ourselves, like we could be in a terrible moment, and then we try to work out of it. And I think that the facilitator, the conveners of these groups can really anticipate that and help. Um, structuring an activity that is directly responsive to the trauma or catastrophe, but is helpful, is extraordinarily important. So a lot of times people can feel like, I just can't go to that Shiva visit. It's just too painful for me to visit the people in the hospital who were affected in this catastrophe, but made it. Like that feeling of wanting to avoid, and some people you know, kind of feel like, oh, I want to get in closer. Like I said, that's the sort of weirdly voyeuristic thing. But a lot of people avoid, like it's, it's just like, I can't do it, it's too hard for me. But I think that if people can get themselves together to you know, taking a class for a Shiva call, taking a class, I mean, appropriate age, preparation, all of that, you know, to a funeral, to a Shiva visit is incredibly important. It is really um, helpful. It is healing and metabolizing of the pain for a group of kids to write cards. I got, I told the story yesterday, you know, about my brother's death and I got little shopping bags on the door of his apartment when I was taking care of him from the kids. My brother was a very isolated sort of guy, but I got shopping bags of index cards that the classes wrote, thank you, Mr. J. He was a tech guy for fixing our computers so I could write my animal story. And I got, and I, and I, I was, I was incredibly touched by that. I laid them out at the ship, like all these cards that people could read because nobody knew my brother since he lived on the West Coast. He was a really isolated guy. But it also, I thought about those second and third and eighth graders who wrote that. Like this was somebody, you know, they were doing something very positive. This is totally not a Jewish area. But this is a human experience though. So, and then I think when people get involved in advocacy. Like if somebody, and I, I'm, I respect different people's politics, but let's say a school shooting leads people to get involved in some kind of gun legislation advocacy. Let's say somebody says like, you know, I really want to, I don't know, fundraise for this family. I want to fundraise for this mental health or whatever it is, you know, tzedakah that's going to help. I mean, how many times have we seen like after God forbid, you know, the Dees family tragedy, we've seen so like a lot of efforts to raise money for different tzedakahs in Israel that will honor that family and, and, the, and the, you know, the beautiful work that they did. But it's also really helpful to the people, you know, who care about that. They're like, okay, I can do something positive out of this tragedy, you know, can be something that is um, generative and that is healing. Um, I'm going to move to something. Oh, I also wanted to say, and, and, and I said this yesterday, you know, about, about the uh, issue of suicide. 
I think that perhaps not at the immediate time, but it's, in some circumstances, it can be very appropriate to create an educational opportunity, whether it's a yom yun on mental illness. And I would never say that, let's say, going back to that horrible example of the JCC, that two months later, they should have had you know, a panel on, I don't know, extreme psychosis and danger. That would have really not been very helpful. Perhaps sometime in the future, that would lead to people would people would be sensitized, like people who are looking at, you know, those huge rosters of programs would see, let's say, at an appropriate time, you know, some uh, program on extreme mental illness in the community. And they would, those people who would want to come would come. But if you don't create it, like most people don't know anything about psychosis. You know, most people don't just don't know much about it. And, it, and the people who do keep it to themselves, because if they have a very mentally ill relative who is such a person, they're not talking about it too much. So that can be an opportunity to create an educational opportunity. I'm going to switch now, and this actually, in a way, it connects perhaps the most to what Rabbi Glatt just talked about, which is secondary trauma and the, um, the stress of chronic chronic stress, you know, he was talking about burnout, but I'm talking about the people who take care of the folks who have gone through um, the, 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 the direct trauma themselves. Um, and here I'm gonna to refer to an experience that I'm actually currently having, which is really fascinating. Uh, and I feel very honored to have been asked to do this. So I got contacted, you know, people sort of know that I do this kind of stuff and my work at YCT and all that. So I got contacted by the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, and they asked me to convene, help convene with a colleague of mine. They were actually going to do two groups because um, yeah, they're the right size for a group is about eight to 12. And if you get too many, you know, it becomes more like, like a, you know, not everybody gets a chance to talk and they had more people than this. So the ADL, as I'm sure most people know, does a tremendous amount of work in, I mean, their whole work is intervening in um, threats having to do with anti-Semitism, anti-Israel. And they are like, they have 40 workers out there across North America who are intercepting their listening posts. They are online, they are going undercover, they're doing all kinds of stuff to, to really anticipate and prevent um, you know, horrible, terrible things. There's unspeakable, I don't just, you know, hate talk, it's like a sewer of hate towards the Jewish people and to the state of Israel. And these are young people. They're not all Jewish, actually. I didn't know that. Um, and they are traumatized. And some of them do get threats. Some of them have, they told me in our first meeting, some of them had that security their own weddings. Um, you know, Rabbi Glad was talking about like having a spouse that you can talk to. Uh, and I totally agree that talking about the stress of work is very important. But in some work, you can't talk about the details or it's too painful. It becomes almost, you know, like you want a safe place at home. I mean, these ADL workers don't really want to talk to their spouses and they, they, they can't or they might be confidentiality issues, let's say for people in the mental health field, where you cannot reveal, you should not be revealing. And I actually tell my students, my, my rabbis, that it's one thing to talk to your spouse. And sometimes, obviously, in rabbinic couples, the, the wife may be also in Jewish, in some sort of Jewish leadership service, usually education, and they may know the same people. And I don't think it's a good thing. I mean, I, I can only advise people do different things. Don't think it's a good thing for the rabbi to be divulging confidential information about people in the community that the wife might also know because she's the principal of the day school. I mean, this happens all the time. And, and sometimes the information leaks and you know, whatever, but this is a much more complicated subject about confidentiality in the rabbinate. But certainly, like going back to my support group for these ADL kids, I would almost say, I mean, I'd say they're average age is probably like 25 to 35 and talk about burnout. I don't know how long they can last in this, but it was really something to, you know, and we, they, we were supposed to be meeting three times, uh, like over three months. And then we're going to have like a, uh, you know, an evaluation, like how is this working? This is a pilot program that we met once and they asked to meet sooner than a month. They said, we need this sooner. Can we meet in two weeks? Um, so we're going to do it. We're going to see what happens. Um, and, you know, I got to say, this is a, you could just say a cheap and easy um, um, gift to give to people 
who are experiencing trauma. Like it's not hard. There's so many mental health professionals who want to be helpful to their communities. And you can't like, you know, it's a school auction. It's like a little sort of weird, you know, to offer three sessions. Uh, if, you're, if you're a psychiatrist, a psychologist, social worker, therapist, like, <laughs> okay, I'm going to, you know, you can come to me three times about your addiction. Like that's not so cool. But to facilitate a support group is really something that a lot of people could do. And this is going to be my, I'm, I'm going to end here, my, my pitch, and I said it before, <laughs> is to um, have physician support groups. I mean, I'm referring to this because that was the slides. Um, or for other fields in which there's a lot of secondary trauma, there's enormous power in people putting things into the group space. It doesn't just sort of you know, I don't know, boomerang around and go into the ozone, people feel a sense of, oh, I'm not the only one. You know, I'm not a freak. I'm not like some deficient person who can't handle this. And by the way, you know what really helped me? You know, Rabbi Glatt talked about this in terms of Yiddishkeit, which I'm totally supportive of. But for people for whom that doesn't speak to, either they're not Jewish and they're, or they're not connected to any faith tradition, you know, the, but the big word that's kind of similar is mindfulness. I mean, that's where the, the mindfulness, sort of not revolution, but discovery, like, like not that this just happened in the last 20 years. Obviously, this is thousands of years old and it's totally incorporated into, into the Torah tradition. But like, hey, this moment will pass. You know, this is terrible, but it's sort of like the weather. You know, a cloud is here now. Oh, thank you. And it's going to, it's going to move out. Um, so I think that, you know, that sense of being with other people who share something, having, um, and, and I just want to say one other thing about that. I just reminded myself, um, accountability in the support group is extraordinarily helpful. What I mean by that is like, I'm, I'm going to just build off of what Rabbi Glatt was talking about. Let's stop pointing to the screen. It's not like live, but I it's sort of, I keep on doing that. Like, let's say he was talking about exercise. So I'm going to just use that. That's really very tangible. So if you have people in a support group and you say, listen, exercise is a really good thing. This is a very cognitive behavior thing. And I was trained as a psychoanalyst, but believe me, I'm a practical person. And I think there's a place to incorporate all of these different types of modalities. And you say, like, exercise, how many people in this group would like to commit, make a commitment now to a certain amount of exercise until the next time we meet? And, you know, some people are going to say, okay, I'm going to do that. And say, I'm going to play basketball. I'm going to go swimming. I'm going to do whatever it is. But the next group, you have a check-in and you see how people did. Now, this is not to give them grades or to give them demerits or whatever. It's to give them an opportunity to check in and say, well, how did this work for you? And to build on that in a positive way, because that's <clears throat> will go forward. That sense of kind of a connection to each other, a commitment to the group, a sense of, I mean, what is a group? You know, it's like a temporary family, a good family that supports you and helps you go forward. So I think I have like, I mean, I know it's 10 minutes over my 1030 time, but it is, it's just maybe 25 minutes. So any thoughts, questions, your experiences, you know, with a, a trauma, catastrophe, what's worked, what's not worked, uh, anything you want to share with the group? No? Okay, then. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank, thank you, Dr. Friedman. Um, the fact that there wasn't a question is because, um, and I'm sure everybody shares that, is that that would really be in the topic on its own for an entire conference. Um, and I think that to try to bottle that then as a group of people. So um, it's just food for thought for us to do. To, um, we're going to take a five minute break, stretch, get those steps into your uh, phone, um, and then we'll reconvene and then we'll have our, our final two talks.
Testing, Ooh. testing, testing. Yeah.
I did my call. I think Can I have your attention, please? Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Five minutes are up. Thank you all. Okay, we're into the home stretch. And um, so we're going to continue with our program for this morning. Um, another um, important topic in this area of mental health that we're going to be discussing confronting caregiver stress and elder abuse. Rabbi Brody. Okay, thank you so much. Like everyone has said, it's been a real pleasure. I have to say that um, I, you know, I've had a lot of interaction with uh, Rabbi Glad and Rabbi Steinberg over the past several months, some members of our rabbinic advisory board. And so I was really looking forward to hearing from and learning from Dr. Ackerman and Dr. Friedman. And it's been a real pleasure, but also in an unexpected way. Because you know, on Friday, we're going like this way, end of life, this way, mental health, right? In other words, the different crises. And I was thinking of thinking like, I'm really depressing. Like, this is terrible. I'm end of life. You know, like, who wants to hear this? And then I heard Dr. Ackerman on sex addiction. And I'm like, I got it good. Right? I'm talking about something, whatever. And so I was telling this to what Debbie and to Michelle. On, and they're like, no, no, no. Ours is reversible. Death is irreversible. So, you know, there's a lot of debate here, right? And it's an interesting discussion. Um, you know, we're in the period of Spirit to Omer. 
And uh, one of the mitzvot is mitzvat sirata omer, when you cut down the omer. I recently heard, I was at the Mizrahi, World Mizrahi Conference, and there's a panel with Rav Hershel Schechter and Rabbi J.J. Schechter and Rabbi Ganak, and things are running late. So Rav Schechter gets up there and he says, listen, it's been a long day, I'm going to speak for two minutes. That's all I did. And I was like, wild, like, wow, that was really like, you know, he's a pretty impressive person. He cut it down. And then Rabbi J.J. Schachter gets up there afterwards and says, there's a mitzvah of Ksirat Omer. It's with an ayin, but sometimes we should think about it with an aleph. So I'm going to be trying to mekayim the mitzvah of Ksirat Omer this morning and keep things short. But I want to take a little bit of background on something which I'm thinking about a lot. If you saw in the flyers that are going around, you will see that. One of the things that Amatai is trying to do is to be practical, meaning we've built the organization in a way that's meant not to be like a think tank and not to write articles and this and that, of course, is very important, but to actually have something to steps so that we can do action items that we can take with us and think about things we can do in our community. Meaning, so it's, it's great, it's important to just talk about things and discuss dilemmas, but what we're really interested in is action items. And what I want to speak about right now is an action item, which I think is important. I'd like to develop an action item for, but I don't know how to do it. We're not sure yet how to do it. And a lot of smart people in this room, a lot of people have a lot of experience in this room. So I want to put it out there for just to throw out some, what I'm thinking about. And hopefully whether now or another point, get some ideas from you about what we can do about it. So one of my favorite shiurim, which I actually, I was a rabbi in yeshiva at the Kotel for 10 years. And when there are prospective students that would come to the yeshiva, I would give a shear on praying for the terminally ill to die. And it's a great sugya. It's really a fascinating question. I always like teaching it because you learn from this sugya the importance of quality of life in, in Judaism. Now, after a while, people said to me, you know, Rabbi Brody, this is a great shear. But 11th graders don't want to come to the yeshiva to talk about how to pray for the terminally ill. That was probably good advice. But nonetheless, it is a very interesting sugya. And one of the very interesting shito that comes up is a fascinating one, which is disturbing on many levels. It's clear from the Gemara. Now, everyone agrees with this later on, but it's clear from the Gemara that there is a notion of saying when a person is terminally ill and suffering, you should pray for them to die. There are different formulations for this. Okay, and there's a different discussion about it. <laughs> there's a very interesting modern shita. It's taken by Chief Rabbi Lau and by others who say, while it might be true that some people can pray for the terminally ill who are suffering to die, it can never be the relatives. It can never be the primary caregivers because it is wrong to have the primary caregivers who are supposed to be in charge of taking care of someone, at the same time being praying for their soul to be returned to the maker. Those two don't work together. And when I teach that, when I mention this shita, some people are nodding and they totally relate to this. And some people get very insulted. I mean, they're like, listen, we took care of our parent or our loved one in a very profound way had nothing to do with we were able to separate the fact that we were praying for Rachamim because they were suffering, we could separate the two. It's a very interesting question. And what it highlights is the phenomenon, which I, I think we all know of, of caregiver stress. Right? Caregiver stress is a massive phenomenon, which we've all seen in one form or another. You know, I first was exposed to myself as, as a child. Uh, my grandfather had Parkinson's. And he had Parkinson's for many years. But my bubby, my grandmother, passed away before him. We didn't have any terminal illness, anything along those lines. And I think it was very obvious that after many years of taking care of him on a really profound level, day to day, the wear and tear of that uh, killed her. There's no doubt about it. And, and whatever, why he wasn't in the nursing home, this or that doesn't matter for now. But I think we've all seen in one form or another, and this phenomenon is only increasing, meaning the fact that we can live longer today in a very um, significant manner for many years, but the quality of life and our dependency on others in such situations creates a tremendous amount of stress for caregivers. Now, Rabbi Steinberg was mentioning earlier all the mitzvot 
that come up, right, with Kibbutz Ava M, which is a classic case, although it, of course, doesn't have to only be in that scenario. And to a certain extent, the mitzvot are very beautiful, but mitzvot in some ways only add to the burden and the stress in some ways, right? Because you have that natural feeling, of course, plus you throw on that God is telling you to take care of your parents. That's not always a relaxing feeling for people. And so we know, and all of us can relate to this in one form or another, what we've seen in our own lives or with other people, the phenomenon of caregiver stress. And the question is, what do you do about it? So this is not a Jewish phenomenon, of course. Many people know about this. And, and there are very, you know, various techniques and um, suggestions that you can see on different websites. And on the Amitai website, we have a little section dedicated to caregiver stress. And we put on there mentioning, you know, things that like some of the obvious things, make time for exercise, right? Just the obvious things, find others who can substitute for you, have open conversations with your family members about how one another can relieve each other, have open conversations about whether they need to be in a nursing home or some other facility, because maybe it's no longer practical for various family members to do it. But my question, which I'm really thinking about is, is there something on a communal level that we can do to address this issue. Because I am sure that all of us know many people who are struggling with this, with their own parents, their siblings, elder siblings, whoever it might be. And is there something on a communal level? You know, the Jewish community is wonderful at Chesed, but obviously, you know, when it's a Shiva or a morning, so we have these meal trains and whatnot, but we're not talking about seven days here or 30 days, right? Caregiver, the stress or myth, frequently isn't from the intense week or two or three. It's the day after day, the week after week, the month after month. Is there something on a communal level which we can do to address the issue of caregiver stress? Now, on a related manner, if we're able to get the website up now, that'd be great if we can pop that up there. On a related level, I'm not saying these two are totally the same thing. They're not. But there is also a phenomenon of elder abuse. Now, elder abuse is not always from caregiver stress, okay? Those two, I want to separate them too. We actually separated them on our website purposely because I don't want to connect them. But the stats say that about one in 10 older, and the, the stats are coming mostly from North America, but other places as well, discuss the phenomenon of elder abuse that one in 10 people over the age of 60 suffer or the are victims of elder abuse. Now, elder abuse can take many different formulations, right? Phenomenon, there's financial abuse, actions that trick, threaten, or persuade older adults of money, property, or possessions. There's neglect, the failure to provide necessities of life. There's physical abuse. There's verbal and emotional abuse, right? And there's sexual abuse. These are serious issues. And if you go onto different sites, and we give you a link here to those sites, right? So you can see that there's certain signs, you know, all of a sudden some random or weird behavior and people's financial, right, their bank accounts might be a sign that something's going on there with financial abuse. Like, let me make a classic example. Um, Mom, I'm not bringing the kids to visit unless you help with their tuition. That doesn't sound so unfamiliar from looking around the room. And you understand that it gets a little bit tricky about this, right? About how that dynamic works, right? But you can understand how this can come up a lot of different ways. The verbal and emotional abuse. Now, sometimes verbal and emotional abuse happens incidentally, not purposely. A lot of times that can come from caregiver stress. But that, that's a real phenomenon. It's a real phenomenon. Physical abuse certainly can happen as well. And I know... It's one of these things you say, oh, the Torah has all these mitzvot of kibbutz avayim and of adarta prezaken, b'chule, right? It doesn't happen in our community. And I think if there's one thing that we've learned from Dr. Friedman, Dr. Ackerman over this weekend is what happens in other communities happens in our community. And we know this is true. We know this is true. We know this is a phenomenon, right? And certainly neglect and, and other issues as well, and even sexual abuse. Right. These things, we know of incidents. These have been reported. These have been documented. So the question then that I'm trying to think a lot about is, you know, what is it that we as a community can do about these issues? Now, to a certain extent, the most important thing that we can do is raise awareness. Right? Just raising awareness, talking about it. 
If you look around on issues of elder abuse and you do like you do a Google search, elder, elder abuse in the Jewish community, you will not find a tremendous amount about this topic. And yet they say that one in 10 of adults over the age of 60 are suffering from it. Now maybe it's a little bit less in our community, perhaps, don't know. But there's very little awareness of the entire issue, just raising the signs. And so one of the things I'm trying to think about is, is there something on an organizational level, whether it's Amatai or some other organization, can do in order to address this issue? Caregiver stress, right, which is a little bit easier to talk about, of course, because we can relate to that a little bit more. It's a little bit more comfortable to speak about. Is there something that we can do on a communal level to think about this? And the answer is that about 10 months ago, I sat down with a bunch of people as I was plotting various projects of Amatai, and I said, listen, we, we got to do something about this. This is serious. And we couldn't come up with a clear project or what to do. And we have other projects we're working on. So I, I've sort of put it to the side right now. But my challenge and my question to the audience, I'm happy to discuss this now or on other occasions, is that is there something that we can do for these types of issues and raise awareness about it? Obviously, there's some things we can do about a public campaign and their videos and you know, there may be shiurim or webinars and whatnot like that. And awareness is great. I mean, awareness is super important as well. But, you know, if I create awareness and someone's got an issue with elder abuse, who are they turning to? So there, there are other organizations in general society that deal with this. And maybe that's just the answer. Maybe that's just the answer. But a lot of times people aren't going to turn for one reason or another to the general community resources. And the question then becomes, do we as a Jewish community have something to offer to people? So I pose this to you as a question. Uh, I don't have an answer, right? It would be probably a better pitch. I know how to solve the issues of living wills. So I know how to offer some form of you know, proposal of what we can do on that issue. I have initiatives in Oregon Nation. I know how to provide rabbinic education. I know how to provide you know, resources and various different issues. This one, I don't know yet. So I welcome your feedback. If there's anyone wants to comment now, please raise your hand. I also include on these flyers one of these QR codes. Where are the Kelman boys? We need the Kelman boys to teach people how to use QR codes here. Right? But if you don't know how to use the QR code, right? so you can uh, just go on the website and stay connected that way as well also works. Right? I'm a very easy person to find. But if there's anyone who has any suggestions or in, you know, ideas about how to deal with this issue, because when you talk to people, and I want to give you a clear couple of examples. Have you ever gone to a shiva where no one's really sad? Not because they didn't love the person, but because the person, their loved one, had sort of died about seven years ago. And since then, they've been in a state of advanced dementia or Parkinson's or the connection. And so the shiva is basically relief. I'm not being critical of all of it. <clears throat> It's a well-known phenomenon. What was going on in those seven years beforehand? What was the family dealing with when they're basically their loved one was dead in practice, but, but not? That was a stressful period. People have to deal with that. There's a lot to work through from that experience. I mean, when your last images of your parents when you can't remember your parents anymore, when they're happy, or when you can't remember your parents when they could recognize you. That's something people have to work through. So it could be this is just an individual issue. We often deal with it in different ways from our, our morning. I suspect there's something as a community we can, we can do to think about these issues. I don't have an answer for it right now, but uh, part of what I'm trying to do is just to raise aware awareness of these things and to create a certain dialogue about it. And if it's not an organization, it's someone else will take up this, these causes, make some pe people, some form of activity. I think there's something to be done, but, but I don't know. But I put it out there. Any, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that So 
So some of the, yeah, so that's a very important point to mention because there's certainly a role for physicians here in noticing these things, right? Uh, one of the signs you look for, if you see some weird bruises and, or other things, or the person looks a little bit malnutritioned, um, there are a number of different signs here. Or they say things to you, suddenly they seem depressed. That could be the case. And there's certainly an important role here for physicians and in, in science in detecting these things. Uh huh. Yeah. Meaning the physician has to be speaking to the caregiver on that. Okay. There's another hand. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, that's an interesting idea. I mean, you're basically suggesting that it's not hard to identify people in the community who are dealing with this issue of caregiver stress or extended caregiving. Right, right. That could be, although some people's Shabbos meals are occupied with taking care of their elders or whatever it might be. That's a good idea. That's an interesting idea. I suspect that's a home initiative, more or less. Yeah. Thank you. There's another hand. Oh, a couple of hands here. Right. Uh, the only thing I'm weary about here is after listening to Rabbi Glatt and knowing all the burnout of the physicians who are dealing with this. By the way, all you physicians are responsible to look out for the children who don't show up to the hospital, the, the doctor's visit. Uh, I am mindful of that. But, but yeah, I mean, doctors have a role here, sure. Is enormous. Rabbi? Community, not that I was thinking about the, the health of the 
I like the idea a lot. I think just making people feel comfortable that's okay to admit that you're feeling this stress right, is, a, is a crucial part here. Maybe the rabbi's role is to bring that up and say, it's okay. You're doing the midst of kibbutz avadem and it's really stressful here. Dr. Warner. Interesting. Last comment. Yeah. Really thought, really talking about it is the show of how, how they deal with people who have children who in need constant care. A show will take the child in for a day or two so the parents have time to respite deal with their, their own issues. That's really the kind of model you have to set up. I don't know how easy it is to do, but that's really the model that they need to find that. Right. Right. Meaning this is a broader expansion of Biko Holden. A broad understanding what that looks like. All right. No, I got this. Right. Uh, so this is super helpful. I, I want to give make sure I don't go over to Dr. Acton, but I welcome anyone who has further suggestions and who wants to take up this initiative. Uh, Imitai is not the Shlomo Brody show. Right. So what we're really trying to do is very much not so. No, no, I mean this seriously. So we're very much trying to empower local ambassadors and Others who want to take up initiatives and we can help give resources and help uh, initiate a lot of things. So uh, Brody at amatai.org is the way to reach me. And uh, thank you so much again for a great Shabbat and weekend. Thank you, Rabbi Brody. Once again, the challenge is out there for the community. Uh, one last uh, uh, talk and one last speaker to go. But before I do so, I just want to take a moment to just um, thank two people um, that, although they may have been mentioned in the past, in the past, in, in this over the Shabbos, I just want to take a, a moment. I know they both are going to say stop, but um, I do want to acknowledge and thank Shana. And I want to thank Ilana specifically for. A lot of hard work, a lot of background, a lot, a lot of phone calls, a lot, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, 
So um, whereas everyone says, oh, uh, Jay, there's a great program, Q1, Q1, things like that, laser, there's a lot of background. So I really, Menelaev, thank you both. I really, really appreciate it. Okay, Dr. Ackerman, take the show away. Okay, so um, I really thoroughly enjoyed this weekend. I thought it was going amazing. And then I see they gave me the very last slot um, <laughs> where people have to catch planes and check out of their rooms. So I feel like at 12 o'clock, the trap door is gonna open and it's like fall through, like, you know, in the old fashioned vaudeville shows. Um, but I'm grateful, all good. So I also wanted to thank everybody here and Tor Motion. It's really been an unbelievable weekend, uh, really incredible. Um, it was organized. Uh, speakers, incredible, tons of information, and the people who are here. I just met some really fantastic, fabulous people. Very, very grateful for that. I also would like to take special mention and thank my husband, who basically takes care of every single solitary thing in my life. So thank you very much, Moshe. You only see me here. He sees me like at two o'clock in the morning. Really good guy. Okay. <laughs> so the learning objectives here. Really, I'm supposed to be talking about stigma, and I'm going to mention a little bit about stigma, but really, I just want to have kind of like a recap of what we did this weekend. Again, things that you can do, some just really take home, very easy things to do, and then a wrap up. All right. So we kind of discussed some of the previous talks that we are a third of 1% of the total world population. One third of 1% is Jews. And I think that's very significant on a lot of levels, but especially for this. And then in another talk, we defined what stigma is. We said that stigma, again, is a combination of inaccurate or distorted beliefs, negative attitudes, discriminatory behavior, which includes stereotyping and separating us from them. So there's the us's and then there's us. In the Orthodox Jewish world, we have stigma, just like we've come to realize that we have other issues that we've been talking about. We're not immune. We do have a tremendous amount of stigma. In the Orthodox Jewish culture, according to Rosen from 2008, stigmatized models of mental illness occur, where the concept of this that mental illness is related to sin. And we touched on that. Many times people look at mental illness and they start to think of an Avera. People are doing wrong. They're saying wrong. They're acting wrong. They're wrong. And they should just cut it out and do some tshuva. When we talk about an issue, let's say like domestic abuse or domestic violence, Dr. Grodner and Dr. Swifek, Dr. Swifek uh, taught me, was on my PhD committee, extraordinary man. They stated that, quote, knowledge in Jewish homes is sparse because the literature focuses primarily on the stigma associated with the problem, not the problem itself. Stigma is greater among Jews that were brought up religious. According to Bronstein, 2004, they found that Hasidic groups were significantly less willing to seek help than yeshivish groups, but yeshivish groups were less, less willing to seek help than modern Orthodox groups. We have a lot in common with the Amish. The Amish, not the Hamish, the Amish. The Amish can really be compared to ultra-Orthodox groups. The similarities would include an adherence to dress and modesty, living according to a religious law in a very strict way, values of submission and conformity, and a very, very strong connection to their religious institutions and their leaders. There was a study done by a group called Miller Fallows and all in 2018. And they described a very successful attempt to bring mental health services to the Amish community. Again, a religious community that really looks a lot like ours. Their approach involved cultural sensitivity and a willingness to meet community leaders where they were at and engage with them. So what they basically did is they started with very small focus groups. A community went to their local church and met with people. Then they went outside that group and outside that group in larger and larger circles that then encompass the community, right? Kind of like the old shampoo commercial, you tell two people and then tell two people and then tell two people, okay. Whoever laughs is my age, okay. And so on and so on and so on. But it's really true. If we start just like this with small focus groups and we talk, 
and we begin to break down some of the walls that are holding us back. And I hope everybody here does go out and does talk about it and talks about the issues that we had and what we can do for it. What this study found was outstanding. The Amish community was able to increase their mental health visits by over 300% in the span of several years. Let's take a little example of how this much work, how this could work. We talked about addiction a lot, or at least I talked about addiction a lot. And when we talk about systems, which we also spoke about, there's something that we call a macro system, which is a very large system, something we call a meso system, which could be like neighborhoods or communities, and something that we call a micro system, which could be individual. So let's say there is an Orthodox Jewish teen that has addiction. There is a breakdown and trust that occurs at the meso level. Then there is what we call the press, right? That environmental press of the macro system, a failure on that teen's community to address, to educate, and to treat the addiction. And that's gonna leave the community feeling very guilty and guilt-ridden. So it's not just the individual with the problem. Like we talked about in family and family systems, there's a ripple effect that's going to filter down into many members and many segments of the community. And if we're just talking about one teen here, well then multiply it by the thousands of teens out there that do have issues with addiction. Greenberg, Buchbinder and Whitsum in 2012 discussed how the Shadok dating process increases stigmatization. People in the Orthodox Jewish community are very, very vested in having their children marry. And that's a good thing. We all want our children to get married. But they describe the concept of yichas, of having that bloodline come down that is perfect. And they describe that, quote, the ideal husband is a Talmud Chacham. The most critical issue is health. Disorders that are not known to be genetic are a limitation, but those of the condition known to be genetic are both a liability, both of themselves and in future generations. They posit that the Orthodox Jewish community will go to great lengths to hide mental illness. In Israel, Haredim are significantly underrepresented in the number of new referrals to community mental health services in Northern Jerusalem. They also found in their 2012 study that therapists in the Orthodox community face these issues like secrecy surrounding treatment, a desire to stop medication to prepare for a shidduch, parental authority and confidentiality. Example, I would like to speak to you about my child, but I do not want them present. And disclosure versus non-disclosure of mental health history in a shidduch and confidentiality in dealing with outsiders concerning a shidduch. Over this weekend, I was told this fantastic joke that I'm gonna share with you. There was a conference and uh, the late, great, 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 great Rabbi Dr. Abraham Torsky was in the audience and he was taking questions and a woman got up and said, I have a son and he's been read a shidduch. There is a significant history of depression in the family. Should I go ahead with the shidduch? And Rabbi Dr. Abraham Torsky looked at it and said, ma'am, are you Jewish? <laughs> There is one more consequence of stigma that I think we need to address. And I didn't really find this in the literature. This is something that I actually thought of this morning. It's something that I wanted to address with you. And that's the concept of loneliness. Loneliness is an extremely powerful emotion that is experienced by many, many, many individual. Loneliness is talked about in Sefer Bereshit, in Parak Bet where Hashem just says, it's, it's not good to be alone. I have to create for you a helper. It's just simply not good. As a matter of fact, the words not good are first mentioned in that Pasuk. That's the first time we hear something is not good, that it is just not good for a person to be alone. In Judaism, we know that every single individual is irreplaceable. Every single individual brings their own unique light and wisdom and energy into this world. Our, our religion is a community religion. We thrive 
on community. You need 10 people to make a minion. Everybody at tables was talking about their COVID minion. I'm standing out on the freezing cold, praying together just so we could be together and fulfill that mitzvah. And Judaism also recognizes in the times of greatest happiness and greatest sorrow, we surround people. A bride and groom get married. They don't just go off on their own. They spend the first week of that married life together with the community, being celebrated, being supported as they launch their new married life. And consequently, in the time of greatest tragedy of death, which we spoke a lot about this weekend, we come together again and we stay around the family. And we are not allowed to talk to them unless they talk to us. We are simply there to be with them, to be a vessel, to hold that deep emotion that our presence is there so that they do not feel alone. Johan Harari states that loneliness is not an absence of people. It's an absence of sharing experience. It's an absence of feeling connected to someone else through the experience. In 1961, a humanistic psychologist named Dr. Clark Moustakis wrote a book on loneliness. And this book was based on his journey with his daughter who was incredibly ill. He describes the searing loneliness he felt that nobody could understand what he was going through. There was no one who could relate to his pain and that made him feel incredibly lonely. And in one very heartbreaking paragraph, he talks about there was a little boy in the room across from his daughter. Now in those days, they didn't allow parents to stay with children in the hospital. And this little boy was very hypervigilant. He was sitting straight up in bed, listening to every noise, glancing at the hallway all the time to see if his mother was gonna come and see him. And Dr. Mustakis watched this and he watched this boy do this for hours until finally the nurse came in and started to yell at him. Your mother was here before. She's not coming until the morning, just go to sleep. Dr. Mustakis claims that the boy broke down wailing piercing sobs, racking his body for being alone in a hospital room with no one there to be with him. We talked about very much the recent pandemic and how people felt incredibly lonely. We talked about how people's mental health suffered because of that loneliness. I know that children eight, seven, six are presenting to clinics with signs of depression. Children that before never would have presented with signs of depression. And it is being hypothesized that it's caused to the two or three years that they were just socially isolated and not with their peers. It would be really wonderful if we could take the lesson from that pandemic if we could remember how lonely we did feel, how it felt to be isolated day after day after day. I think one person here very honestly said to me, I thought I was gonna eat my children. And that was an honest feeling, frustrating, alone, nobody being able to understand your individual circumstance of what that isolation did to you. And a very recent article last month, April of 2023, Dr. Vivek Murthy, who is a Surgeon General, discussed loneliness. He stated that one out of two Americans at any given time experience loneliness. And loneliness, he states, is incredibly insidious. Why? Because it's silent. It comes in very quickly and it stays for a long time and it is extremely quiet. A lot of things can create loneliness, loss of a job, loss of a loved one, God forbid, and stigma. Stigma breeds loneliness and stigma feeds loneliness. I think it is time, I think it's time for everybody to kind of step out of their comfort zone. I think it's time for everybody to approach somebody that doesn't make them comfortable. 
somebody that has addiction, somebody that has mental illness, somebody that looks different than you. And not in a derogatory way, and not in a patronizing way, and not in a, okay, I'm going to do my mitzvah for the day and get a little star chart on Dr. Ackerman's chart of doing mitzvahs, but in a respectful, dignified, accepting, maybe curious way. Like, really, who are you? What are you? You're a human being. Hashem created you, and nobody else is ever going to be like you. As I came down the elevator here, there must be some program going on. And I saw not a teenager, honestly, I don't know if it was a boy or a girl. And they're all wearing hot pink shirts. Oh, I'm not being sarcastic. I really can't tell. And their hair was dyed hot pink. And I noticed it and I got in the elevator and I said to the adolescent, I'm like, oh my God, you matched your hair exactly to the t-shirt. I mean, that is the exact shade of pink. And I got this big smile. I said, that was the point. I said, well, you nailed it. And I got this really big smile. I have no idea who this person is. But I hope that what I said showed them that, wow, I reckon there's something interesting. That's nice. I don't have to judge whether I like pink hair or not. Who cares? I was able with one sentence to make somebody smile. I don't even know that person. That is what we need to be doing in our community. It's not magic. It's not difficult. It's human. I wanted to end on an upbeat note. We've talked about some very intense topics, some very difficult topics, all of them important, but I am the eternal optimist and I wanted everybody to leave here on a positive note. This is from the book, The Positivity Bias by Rabbi Mendel Kalmanson. And he writes in there, the Lubavitcher Rebbe was about to give his inaugural address on the 10th day of Shvat. His audience represented the small remains of a very once large and glorious Hasidic dynasty, which had numbered in the hundreds of thousands across Eastern Europe. Many of the people present had lost their family to Stalin or to the Holocaust. Others had migrated to America and they started to assimilate into American culture. It had been one year since the previous Rebbe had passed away and the future of the Lubavitch movement was uncertain. The Hasidim were very distraught and nervous. And the new Rebbe started with these words, Bati Lagani, come to my garden. Those were the same words that his father-in-law, Rabbi Yitzchak Yosef, had used in his last speech, which had been published one year earlier, to the day. That was a very subtle but powerful action of linking the trauma of the past to the hope of our present and future. For the next four decades, the Rebbe would reveal more about his father's final teaching at the annual gatherings, Bati Lagani. Despite uncertainty and despite destructive chaos, the world is not a cruel and meaningless place. It is the place that God has chosen to reside. We will celebrate Shavuos in a few days. And in Shavuos we know, we stood together, all of us together, to receive the greatest gift we have received, the Torah that has led us through countless thousands of years of difficulty. Bati Lagani, come to my garden, and in my garden, everyone is welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Acker. Thank you, Dr. Ackerman. I was wondering how you were going to pull that off and make that upbeat, but you did. You didn't disappoint. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, really with the mixed motions that we are concluding our program. 
The final thank you really is out to you, the audience. Without you, the audience, this of course does not take place. All of the accolades and the works and everything else at the end of the day, thank you so much for attending and for always being so supportive. There are some box lunches um, in next door. Um, and once again, have a safe trip, whether it be to Thornhill or to Australia. Have a wonderful day.